Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Ash Kamlashkari, MOASC president. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're now on our uh, eighth uh, uh, monthly webinar discussing advances in various areas of uh, non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, Dr. Hatim Hussein, our uh, 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 leader here, and uh, will be overseeing this wonderful talk. We have two uh, fantastic panelists uh, that will be joining us, Dr. Edward Guerin and Dr. Aaron Lisberg, uh, both from uh, UCLA and uh, both uh, uh, leaders in the field of uh, lung cancer, and we're so excited to have them here with us. Um, this is an exciting uh, topic and one that uh, continues to evolve, and that is the management of unresectable stage three non-small cell lung cancer. Um, I'm delighted to have uh, all of you guys join. And at this point, I'm going to send over uh, the uh, responsibility and duties to Dr. Hussain. Go ahead and uh, take us through this uh, interesting journey of stage three non-small cell lung cancer. Um, thank you, Dr. Lishkari, and, and really it's a pleasure to be here and, um, and speak with you all today. We have a, a, a very um, great opportunity to kind of really get some input from some of the thought leaders in this space with Dr. Eddie Guerin, uh, who's a professor at UCLA, and Dr. Aaron Listberg, um, also uh, you know, faculty at UCLA, to really kind of understand and dissect some of the complexities in um, you know, some of the arenas as we approach the earlier stages of lung cancer. Again, as you all know, we have been kind of focusing in prior discussions on some of the metastatic components of lung cancer in terms of how we have you know, uh, dissected the molecular as well as immune therapy considerations. In the next several series, you know, we are approaching um, some of the components of the earlier stages of lung cancer. I also want to highlight we we've had the opportunity to, um, you know, kind of build out and as some of these considerations really rely on multidisciplinary teams. Also in attendance is, is Dr. Uh, Joshua Boys, who is uh, a thoracic surgeon here at UCSD, who will also provide input, partly because while the topic of this discussion is unresectable stage three, defining resectability and understanding resectability as a moving target is an important aspect of you know, this question. And also I think colors how we think through which are the right patients uh, that may be eligible for um, resection. You know, how do we engage in a multidisciplinary team to kind of get those answers met about resectability? And then ultimately, um, you know, should resectability be defined up front? Should it be an evolving concept based on prior response? I think these are great questions that we can dissect out today. So with that, actually, here's just a pictorial slide, which uh, depicts how um, you know, the various stages of lung cancer have uh, evolved, uh, particularly the early stage, in terms of resectable disease, the trials actually that have bred uh, out and um, in terms of, uh, you know, some more mature than others, but, um, you know, obviously we have an FDA approval now for uh, resectable stage 1B, 2, and 3A with the Checkmate 816. Um, again, this is neoadjuvant chemo and IO. And uh, we also have an approval for adjuvant atezolizumab by the Empower 010. We have uh, data that's been presented about pembrolizumab in the adjuvant setting, uh, Kino 091, also known as a PEARL study. And then obviously uh, we also have uh, data on um, molecular approaches in the early stage with the approval of OCMertinib based on EGFR mutation, exon 19 deletion uh, post-surgery. For the unresectable stage three, we have um, guidance from uh, you know, phase three and now five-year data about consolidation dervalumab post-chemo radiation. And then you know, obviously uh, you know, a repertoire of different approaches in stage four. 
So with that, actually kind of kind of um, circle back to this individual slide. And my first question actually is, is for you, Dr. Boys. And firstly, thank you for, for joining on, um, on this day today. Um, in attendance, actually, uh, we have um, our team from UCLA as well. And um, you know, I think if you could help us kind of assess some of the considerations that you think through and how you view which patients are better candidates to even, you know, upfront from a medical oncology perspective, know how we need to think through that fundamental question up front. I think that would be very helpful. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. And, um, you know, just like from a physiologic standpoint, you know, the baseline is, you know, the FEV1 or the DLCO after we calculate you know, how many segments we'd have to remove for earlier stage one. If they're less than 40%, um, then we do take that into um, consideration. Otherwise, major cardiac disease, but kind of our low level is, can they walk up two flights of stairs? You know, and if they can't do that without losing a lot of breath or dropping their sats below, you know, 93%, then they're, they're, it's not that they're unresexual, it's just they're not really great surgical candidates. Um, and then the other thing as far as farther disease is, um, you know, most three A's, as long as it's not bulky multi-station N2 disease, um, they're generally considered resectable. Um, and then some, even 3Bs, depending on what the 3B criteria are, if it's including like say a T4 lesion, you know, not all T4s are unresectable. And so there's a mix and match of 3A and 3B that, you know, depends on nodal disease spread and tumor size. And so I don't know how much into the detail of the weeds you want to get into like T4 and, and nodal disease, but I'm happy to go there if you want. Sure. I think, you know, kind of, um, you know, perhaps actually as we, because this issue is such a fundamental topic and as we're seeing early stage patients, even those nuances about, you know, how, you know, how we think through, like, what are some considerations in patients that may have smaller tumors, but you still deem unresectable? You know, how do you think through, are there certain yeah. sort of contraindications that you think kind of should be red flags when we think through? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So if we, if we have a small T stage and it's based off a of nodal, then, so a single N2, that's certainly resectable. Once you get into two N2 stations, you know, you start pushing the limits. Um, kind of a low level baseline is like if they have tumor in three spots, you know, that are suggesting distance other than a hyalur node, then we start questioning resectability or are we going to be able to cure them of their disease? Um, a contralateral 3B, you know, on the, say it's a right-sided tumor with a, with a 3B with a contralateral lymph node, that's certainly something we would consider unresectable. Um, and then some people would say extra nodal, uh, you know, growth, but that's really hard to know because in this day and age, we're really just um, treating everybody with upfront chemo and you won't know until you're in there for surgery. Certainly if some of the bulky disease is invading some of the, you know, vital mediastinal structures, aorta, SBC, IBC, um, you know, those types of things. And then there's the distant disease, um, oligometastatic, you know, certainly if they have one spot, you can do it, multiple spots, you know, we, we really try not to. And then the T4 stage. So um, classic structure, classically for a guideline, if it invades into the mediastinal fat a little bit, that's still resectable. But if you're talking like a greater than three centimeter invasion into the mediastinal fat, you have to question whether or not you can get a get an R0 resection. Um, as far as like the esophagus or major vessels, that's generally a contraindication to resection, although in some cases like the innominate um, vein can be resected. Even a partial SVC reconstruction can be considered. Um, and then the vertebra. Um, so even they used to say up to two, you know, partial vertebral bodies could be resected on block as far as the chest wall resection goes. Um, after that, it gets a little, you know, the spine becomes unstable. 
and you know this is all to be said like these are robust fit patients you know not your kind of borderline or sectable candidates you know these people that you try and take it on an individual basis um but those are some of the more classic t4 and then um the last ones would be you know if you have like another spot in the middle lobe and an upper lobe you know we would generally do the lobe and then a wedge in the middle lobe to clear the disease um I think that covers kind of T4 nodal disease data. It is an interesting topic though. I mean, even if like with like that checkmate E16 paper, you know, the complete pathologic response is quite remarkable. So even a fit robust person, if they had a contralateral 3B and you, I could go in there and take it out after some you know, upfront neoadjuvant chemo IO and there's a complete pathologic response. I mean, it's, certainly borderline and aggressive but i think a lot of things are kind of coming back into you know being on the table if it's thoughtful yeah super helpful i think it's so valuable to have your input on this and um i think kind of you know part of the goal here and i think actually speaking to one of the questions that's come up from dr lashkari is is this concept that um you know with the evolution of, you know, uh, neoadjuvant strategies in um, in lung cancer, um, you know, I think this question of defining resectability up front or as a moving target is is important. And I may actually turn this to you, Dr. Garen, kind of at this point at UCLA in um, in your multidisciplinary tumor boards. You know, how do you guys discuss this topic? Do you do you view resectability as a categorical upfront decision, and um, or do you view it in in discussions with your surgeons and radiation oncologists as something where um, you know the, like you've seen different trends and how starting with chemo IO first stage three, you know, how do you see that evolving? Sure. I think the one thing that we do try to do is we do try to determine upfront whether or not we consider it to be resectable. Um, that doesn't mean that things can't change because obviously they can. Um, but we like not to go in with sort of a vague plan of maybe we'll operate. Um, we sort of like to have determined whether or not we think that it's an operation. I think that uh, Ashkan's question is a good one. And you know, this this the this resectable versus unresectable stage three is always a fascinating one because um, we talk about it like it's a definitive decision um, and that the criteria are clear, but they're not. And of course, um, you know, sort of the largest study in this setting really didn't show clear benefits between chemo radiotherapy and a surgical approach, um, although. Um, in looking back, the patients who required a pneumonectomy did quite poorly with surgery. The patients who uh, did not uh, appear to do better with surgery, and that's generally the basis on which we've we've treated. But I think that the question that's being asked is a, is a very difficult one because that intergroup study that we always quote, as we start to integrate more um, more data, becomes less and less relevant to what our questions are today. And I know. My, my friends, uh, Naira Rizvi and Solange Peters, who wrote the original editorial on the Pacific trial, basically you know, angered a lot of thoracic surgeons by saying that this has now settled things after Pacific came out. You know, based on this data, you know, in these cases, we should be going to a chemo radiotherapy followed by, by, by immunotherapy. Um, and although I think that was probably too bold, I do think that if you had the opportunity to incorporate immunotherapy in that setting, it, it, it seemed like a reasonable approach. Now, I think that you're seeing the pendulum swing back a little bit because now that there are um, reasonable approaches for uh, immunotherapy incorporation in, in a surgical setting as well, um, I think this has really reopened this. But I think that from our perspective, we do try to determine upfront whether or not we think that surgery is, a, is appropriate. And obviously there's some people whose scans will look better after, for instance, new adjuvant chemoimmunotherapy, um, but still we, we, we like to have made our decision upfront. Okay. 
Okay, so very helpful. You know, I may actually extend on that question a bit and say, you know, how, you know, describe your multidisciplinary tumor boards a little bit more. Like, how are they functioning? Is it something where um, all of your stage three patients are discussed in the multi-D? Is it kind of just up to, you know, whoever wants to bring them up to the molecular tumor board? I mean, how do these patients get discussed there? Right. So there are two separate things we have. One is we actually have a, a clinic where people can come and see patients across the different specialties. So basically in the same clinic, they're able to see thoracic surgery, radiation oncology, medical oncology, oftentimes uh, pulmonary. Um, so that is a, a separate issue. But when it comes to the tumor board, um, there's no requirement that people present cases. Um, and pay, practitioners generally present their more complicated cases. And it does tend to disproportionately, as you can imagine, be these stage three locally advanced cases because those are the ones um, where really I think a wide range of inputs is helpful and getting um, all the people with their different expertise to discuss the case, it, it really can make a big difference. Super helpful. And Dr. Lisberg, you know, kind of, um, you know, what is your take on this actually? You know, how do you view in the patients that, that you have kind of these working dynamics across the different multi, um, or the multidiscipline, you know, kind of across the disciplines here? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, as Eddie um, kind of highlighted, I think it's all about good communication and, uh, you know, close communication with all the different uh, specialties that can be involved from radiology to surgery to radiation oncology. And just, again, identifying what the options are for a patient. And sometimes there is more than one option which case it's also important to involve the patient and identify kind of risks and benefits of different approaches. And I think that through that, through, you know, having good communication and, and involving the patient in some instances, um, we typically arrive at that, what I believe is the right decision. No, sounds great. Um, so I think Dr. Jang has a question. Um, you know, thank you, Dr. Jang, for joining us as well. Uh, perhaps like you can, um, you know, give us an insight into kind of how Kaiser is, is working as well as a whole across the multidisciplinary teams. Um, but first, before we get there, actually, you know, want to address your question, which is um, if one is not able to completely rule out resectability. Um, so I guess, and this is actually a really good question, you know, Dr. Boyce, for you, we've been in the circumstances, is if a patient has an incompletely staged mediastinum, and it's unclear what the, um, like, you know, if N2 positivity is unclear, how do you view, so firstly, you know, kind of what our goal should be in, it, in staging the media assignment completely up front? And does this influence the decision about a neoadjuvant approach versus uh, chemo rads and consolidated therapy? You know, just any thoughts you have, Dr. Boys, on this matter about, you know, how, how much should we push the limits to make sure we get complete staging, realizing that getting complete staging requires a lot of logistical work, you know, can take time, you know, a lot of barriers sometimes to kind of get that. I mean, I'm personally in favor of doing appropriate mediastinal staging um, in, in selected cases. I mean, usually for me, it's like three centimeters or greater. And certainly if there's any question on, on PET, and, um, you know, it's because it changes things, you know, I, I think to some degree of resectability or unresectability, um, you know, I think of two cases recently, a lady got neoadjuvant therapy and they never staged her media sign and then she came for resection. And then I said, you know, Hey, we should look at the mean, because if you have a contralateral node that's positive then you know, I'm not going to help you and I'm probably going to hurt you potentially. So I did the meet and she ended up having, it was a left-sided tumor and, and then she had a 4R that was positive on the knee. And so it was good, you know, it, it changed her management. And so where she probably needs additional therapy, you know, if I had done the lobe and she's a borderline patient, then she may not get to recovery to a place where she can get the, the therapy. Um, because neither therapy nor surgery are freebies. And, you know, you have to be certain, certainly physically fit to, to receive those to some degree. And um, so if, if you can, if you do the lobe or things like that up front, and now they need systemic therapy, 
but you've put them in such a condition that they actually can't get the optimal systemic therapy. Um, and you find out on the back end post-resection that they have N2 disease. And I think you've kind of done that patient a disservice, whereas you could have given it to them up front and then do the surgery on the back end. Um, and so I don't, that's, I, I feel pretty strongly about it, you know, as long as it doesn't have to take a significant amount of time. It was super helpful actually. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, we've definitely been in that circumstance of saying, you know, how, you know, how aggressive do we need to be about getting this? I think in speaking to Dr. Jang's question and, and Dr. Jang, you know, feel free to unmute yourself too, if you'd like to, you know, address this point more, but the way I interpret your question is, is that if, if a surgeon's not completely able to uh, stage uh, with, with then two uh, confirmations of either positive or negative, does that influence one's decision to be more likely to consider say a neoadjuvant approach versus a, a chemo rads um, and the consolidation immune therapy approach? Is that, is that what, uh, you know, kind of, uh, your question was, Dr. Zhang? Yeah, very similar. I just, uh, you know, I mean, obviously different institution, uh, you know, have a different type of approach, but uh, I just feel that, you know, even among our institutions, uh, we know there are certain surgeons that are a lot more aggressive than some other surgeons. Uh, so the opinion, you know, for example, uh, <laughs> like, in, in, in the old days, if our surgeon here at Riverside uh, look at the case and, you know, maybe it's a borderline case or resectability, he usually doesn't want to do it and he go chemo radiation. But soon, uh, sooner or later, we learn that if I send it to a Kaiser LA, they're going to operate on this patient. <laughs> so, and then so sooner or later, we start to realize, wow, well, there's, you know, there's certain limitation or aggressiveness on various different surgeries. Some, some surgeons are willing to operate a lot more. So, I mean, so, so, so for the, you know, usually I have seen some surgeon even now ruling out multi-station and twos. So my question really is, you know, uh, if, if those cases, can we, uh, you know, doing, doing the new agile approach with the A16 or chemo IO and, uh, and how, what does the surgeon think? Is that still a feasible uh, possibility? Even at the, uh, from the get-go, he doesn't think this is resectable. You know, and and if that's a if if that's a case, then what kind of case would the surgeon go that route? You know, that's that's kind of one what I, what I have experienced uh, here in our institutions. Yeah. Um, I mean, Dr. Boyce, you want to take that question? Yeah. Sorry. Um. Yeah, so I think what you're saying is if you can't stage it and you do the chemo IO up front and then say, okay, now is it resectable? Is that kind of what you're saying? Like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I, you know, like yeah. if there, if I got two different opinions, you know, one from Riverside, like I said, one from LA, and one one say, yeah, yeah, I, I think I can do it, and the other one say, no, no, definitely you have to go chemo RT. My thinking yeah. is, well, is this a a, a case or uh, can we do a checkmate one six approach and? If so, what are, is anything that I need to pay attention to? Maybe there's a specific profile that we could go this route. You know? Right. Um, there, you know, it's hard because you know you're kind of at the within. You know, you're you're depending on your surgeon, and and I think it's been stated before, and I agree with this. Like sometimes it could go either way, and it's important to involve the patient in that discussion too, because there are some patients who absolutely don't want to have surgery or, you know, be uncomfortable and, um, you know, and maybe you go the, the other way. And the other one is maybe it's a shot and, you know, they're young and healthy and robust and you say like, Hey, we're willing to give you this shot. And so it becomes a little, it's not as clear cut number, number one. So a lot of it, they kind of present it to the patient and how you present it to the patient. Um, and number two is, um, we've kind of struggled with this at our institution too, not struggle, but like trying to define, like if you're going to say something's unresectable, then I think you, and it's been said, you should probably stick to that um, and not try and take something that's unresectable and, and make it resectable um, in these more advanced cases at least. And so I certainly feel your pain where, you know, you have one surgeon who kind of doesn't want to do maybe a harder case um, and another surgeon who's like willing to just, you know, give it a best shot. And um, 
that that's that's tough from like you know, some some political standpoints, I guess, to some degree, and and also from a patient care standpoint, it's hard to just say there's a certain profile. But I think you know if it's if it's distant nodal disease or just bulky disease, um, then you can probably say it's unresectable if it's like invading major structures. But some of it too is one of the things you can look at if it's like a, a if it's a T4 issue stage, then you should look at how what is it abutting and if they can get an R0 resection. And if they can do that, and usually if it's less than 90 degree effacement on like say a, a vasculature or a vessel, and you can always call your radiologist and say like, is it invading or is it just abutting? And they may not be able to tell you, but if they can say there's greater than 90% effacement or it's involving it, then yeah, it probably is unresectable. Um, and then as far as nodal disease goes, um, you know, if it's if you have the tumor in three different locations, unless they're really sure they can get all the spots out, you know, it might actually be unresectable. Um, or if it's like really, really bulky or invading into the airway. It doesn't, I, I know that's not like a perfect answer, but like that's, <laughs> and I'll just say this, like, you know, I, we cover the Kaiser down in San Diego. So if there's ever a patient you want me to look at, you know, send me an epic message and I, I'll be happy to look at the case. Yeah. No, I think that's fantastic. And actually, Dr. Zhang, I think that also speaks to the fact that, you know, um, in this case, and I think Dr. Guerin had mentioned this, is the question of defining resectability does have, um, you know, some nuances around subjective components or kind of, uh, you know, those. And so getting additional opinions, I think, is something that perhaps is, is also a take home here is, is that, um, you know, as we think through how to define resectability, you know, that is, it's, it's something to weigh in. Um, so I, you know, this was, you know, fantastic to kind of, you know, really get that, um, you know, here were some of the questions actually that we wanted to address. I think we addressed a good number of these. Um, I think that, um, um, you know, I think Dr. Boyce, you had mentioned single station versus multi-station nodal disease. Do you mind kind of telling us a little bit more about how you think that through in terms of, um, you know, resectability? You may have actually mentioned it before, but... Um, and what circumstances would multi-station nodal disease, you know, be resectable? And how do you think that through? Yeah. So, you know, so it depends. So multi-station, you know, you could have an N1 and an N2. I would think that's totally resectable. Or you have like N2 um, at four and seven. Now, if they're not like super bulky and extra nodal and the patient's robust, you know, I wouldn't say no right away, but that would be a multi-station case. But if sometimes what they'll present with is like, you know, an N2 and an N4 that are like pushing the, the SVC over and the other ones like bulging into the carina, you know, and it, you can tell there's just this extra nodal extension, then those I would probably say would be unresectable uh, multi-station. Mm -hmm. So super helpful, you know, really great. Um, I think one thing actually, Dr. Boyce, too, you know, in this is here at UCSD, I believe there's been kind of considerations to have all stage three patients presented in a multidisciplinary tumor board. Do you feel like that, um, you know, is that kind of, you know, um, happening? And I guess, you know, in this, it, it sounds like, you know, Dr. Guerin at, and Dr. Lisberg at, at UCLA, there's not kind of say like a, a disease team mandate or anything like that, that all stage three be presented. Is that, um, is that correct? And, and Dr. Boyce, is that, is that correct from your understanding as well? Here. Was, so maybe, was that for me, Haltham, or was that for? Actually for any, you know, for all, you know, kind of who wanted okay. to comment on that. Mm -hmm. So, so one of the things that's a little unique at UCLA is we have, you know, a large number of community practices, some of which are close by and some of which are quite a distance. So that goes both directions and probably is part of the reason that we don't have a strong mandate. 
we do want to give someone who is at a UCLA practice in San Luis Obispo the option of presenting their case at the UCLA Thoracic Tumor Board to get input. On the other hand, we don't want to mandate it because um, uh, it may be impractical and may in some cases uh, step on toes of, of people and, and not be exactly what people want. So um, we have not mandated um, presentation of, of any case. We do allow, um, in addition to the people who are on main campus, these patients, these practitioners at the community sites as well. Um, and like most, most of you, most of our meetings have gone to, to, to virtual format now. Um, so we have gotten an increased number of people who are presenting cases um, sometimes at some of the more distant sites. And I think that's, um, you know, that's certainly an, an been an interesting aspect and, and part of the issue where for us, we, we sort of allow the individual practitioner to decide whether to present and get input. Yeah, super, super helpful. You know, I think that's great. Um, may I ask, actually, because you have such a unique system with so many community sites also, um, you know, integrated within the UCLA network, how, do you view, um, like, how do you view this issue being, uh, like, evolving in the community? Is it quite, it, it, you know, just from the nature of how we've been even presenting this and discussing it, you know, for someone looking on, I mean, this is very heterogeneous and quite complex. How, like, you know, how is it working out in within your network across all these, you know, considerations? Well, I think it's a very good point, right? So I think it, it, if you're at a place where you don't have these additional sites and everyone throughout the care, for instance, is, you know, in a, in a, a, a very small circle, it's much easier to do that. But we, maybe in a case where the surgeon is with one health group, the radiation oncologist is with another health group, both of which have nothing to do with UCLA, and the medical oncologist is UCLA. And, and I think that probably is a very different system. And I think that we probably are going to need to have different systems for different places. And some people um, may feel much more comfortable presenting a case in a multidisciplinary tumor board in their own location with the surgeon they typically use and the radiation oncologist pulmonologist that they normally use. Sometimes, particularly in cases where they where they find it to be particularly complex, uh, they they may be looking at, you know, getting sort of an additional opinion uh, beyond what they've gotten locally. So I think it, it works both ways in our system. I make a comment, uh, Dr. Singh. No, please. Um, uh, you know, working in the, the community, uh, being in a practice that's independent and working with, uh, you know, people who may represent different healthcare systems and, and, and not necessarily having one uh, uh, model for therapy where everything is, let's say, in-house, in like it may be at an academic center, um, it, it, it is challenging in, in navigating these questions that you're presenting um, because, um, you know, it, it really requires someone to take the lead in making sure that, you know, all these questions are being answered appropriately and that there's good cross-communication. And, and oftentimes, you know, this is done beyond just the, uh, beyond just a tumor board because, you know, you have to kind of follow up on, 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 on scans and studies and, you know, so it becomes an, an, an ongoing discussion beyond what may have just been dis, you know, discussed at a tumor board. And sometimes you know, that, that can get challenging. But I, I will say that um, I think it, it requires more kind of work from you know, the people who are in the communities to make sure that these patients, uh, you know, that these questions are answered in the best way possible. I, I, I will say that one thing that I have uh, noticed with discussion with the thoracic surgeons that, that I work with is that um, in trying to determine resectability, I know that there has been an increase in the utility of, of mediastinoscopies to try to um, uh, stage the patient a little bit more effectively beyond using imaging or even EBUS. So we get a little bit more tissue and really see what, what the staging may be 
Um, and that, that has provided some benefit in answering some of these questions. Yeah, super helpful. You know, thank you, Doug Lashkari. And actually, you know, hearing uh, your thoughts on in real world uh, scenarios in, in community practice, how, how are we gonna bring these teams together and work? May I ask actually, would you be able to provide a little bit more color on, on how you guys have a, your multidisciplinary tumor board? Like, you know, how does so that- we, um, Yeah, so we, we have a multidisciplinary tumor board, but it's not always well attended by, you know, let's say the, the thoracic surgeons. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, not every party is present. And so in situations like that, it becomes more of an ongoing discussion between, you know, let's say, my, you know, myself, uh, the, the radiation oncologist, the surgeon, sometimes it involves, you know, um, sending group threads through, through, through texting or, um, you know, having a discussion kind of with each party separately and them themselves discussing and so forth. So it's not a, always a, a, a naive ideal scenario where you have all the data in front of you, you have the opportunity to present the case uh, before a tumor board and then be able to make resolute decisions that then, you know, provide a, a more clear, you know, focus. It, it's it's a, sometimes can be a, a little messy as medicine always is, you know, decisions that are made sometimes a little bit more, um, you know, in, 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 in these sort of circumstances, if you will. Super helpful. So with that, actually, we'll just uh, we'll move on to you know some of the considerations after a patient has been deemed unresectable. You know, patient has gotten chemo radiation. Now, actually, consolidation uh, immune therapy is uh, is standard of care based on the Pacific study. Um, I may ask, actually, you know, Dr. Lisberg, in in your practice. Uh, for patients with unresectable stage three who are getting chemo, do you have a preferred, you know, chemo regimen, and how do you approach some of the chemotherapy considerations there? Yeah, so <clears throat> you know, obviously, you have to individualize to each patient. Um, I use two different regimens. So, um, in my really fit patients, I'll use um, cisatoposide, um, and in potentially my less fit patients, for lack of a better way of saying it, I'll use weekly carbotaxel. Um, sometimes I use Kind of like an age discriminator, discriminator around 65 years, but that obviously can change based on the specific patient. Um, but that is generally how I choose my chemotherapy approach. And you know, I, I do talk to my patients up front, especially some of the kind of more frail patients where I'm giving carbotaxel, that the that the real role of the chemotherapy is to chemosensitize the radiation. And then oftentimes we won't get chemo, you know, it's planned for every week, but we may not get every cycle. There may be depressions and blood counts over time or other logistical issues. And that's okay. That's kind of part, that's part of the process. I don't want to, um, I don't want to say that we're going to give chemotherapy with every single week of radiation if it's not feasible. And I think preparing that, because I've been in many scenarios with my elderly patients where they just can't tolerate weekly carbotaxel, and, and that's part of the process. But I just emphasize the most important component is certainly the radiation um, sensitizing. And I do introduce um, the concept of dervalumab before we even start with the chemotherapy and radiation. I think that's very important. Chemotherapy and radiation is obviously pretty intense uh, regimen and it, it causes a lot of you know, potential toxicity in patients. And, um, you know, by the end of that, patients oftentimes uh, are feeling somewhat beat up and, and not knowing that there's another component to it. And just introducing it after the completion of chemo radiation, I think can be very problematic. I think that introducing the immunotherapy up front can also be very helpful. Patients are very excited about pursuing immunotherapy approaches. And so um, letting them understand from the beginning, from the get-go, that immunotherapy will be the, uh, a planned component of your treatment um, and will follow uh, the chemo radiation. Um, I think that that's how I generally approach it. Super helpful. Um, may I ask, actually, are you doing molecular testing? Um, in this stage, I mean, is that kind of integrated in any of your decision making? Yeah, I am. Uh, and we've been doing, uh, I've been doing that for a while. Um, and that's really to inform uh, uh, the consolidation to value map afterwards. I mean, the approval does include patients with EGFR alterations, um, but certainly uh, there's a lot of data to suggest those patients really aren't going to uh, obtain significant benefit and there's potential increased toxicity. So 
I do like to have that information. I do like to have PDL one, for instance. I think that these are just things that color our, our discussion. If a patient does have an EGFR mutation, you know, it is it is approved and, and is something that can be considered, but I, I do dissuade my patients from pursuing that. And in some cases, although not approved in this setting, osimertinib, um, if, if I'm able to uh, secure it and as a young patient and we want to use that um, in place of Dervalumab, again, not an approved approach, but it is something I have done in select cases. It's really great to hear your practice. So just to clarify then, so um, based on PDL1 results, if you had a PDL1 negative patient, would would you then um, you know you know kind of uh, discourage the patient against immune therapy for consultants? No, I, I would still give it. Uh, again, I think that um, uh, the risk benefit ratio I still think uh, supports, um, but I think it can just inform the discussion. Again, the idea that the PDL1 zero with that patient is potentially less likely to um, derive benefit. And certainly, you know, if they were having some toxicity, uh, I may be more likely to stop the therapy in a patient like that based on toxicity, uh, as opposed to a patient with high PDL1. Again, that patient's more likely to benefit and maybe we would um, try to push through the toxicity in some ways. Again, you know, there's no like uh, hard and fast rule here. Um, but I think that more information uh, is better, especially uh, with a marker like PDL1, which is, uh, I think, highly predictive of response. And I think that sharing those uh, pieces of information with the patient um, is beneficial. Well, thank you. And, and just for the audience as well, actually, there is an ongoing clinical trial called the LORA study, you know, which is uh, consolidation OC-mertinib post-chemo radiation in patients actually who have EGFR mutations. Um, that study is designed in a way where patients will get chemo radiation and then OC mertinib, and that's being compared to chemo radiation. I think some of the critiques of the study is should you know should it be combined? I mean, should it be compared to the Pacific regimen instead of just a control arm of chemo rads? I think it's confusing, but um, you know, as a whole, some of the considerations are if patients get immune therapy who are EGFR mutant and then get OC mertinib post. At progression, you know, um, you know, um, at least if we extrapolate info from actually Dr. Lisberg, Uris, and Dr. Garen's study, actually highlighting some of the complexities of getting immune therapy prior to um, uh, EGFR TKs and osimertinib, perhaps specifically. I may actually ask you guys while you guys are on this panel, you know, in such a, a key um, pivotal. Um, evaluation you did in this way, do you view that consideration around immune therapy and then OC mertinib as being very particular with OC mertinib? Or, you know, kind of would you, uh, you know, have the same concern with erlotinib post and uh, fitinib? And, you know, how do you view each of the TKIs in terms of their specificity for some of the reactions that you discuss in your paper? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I don't think it's osimertinib specific. Um, if you, you know, on our trial, um, what you're referring to, obviously, is the toxicity we saw. And what was most concerning was the one patient who got a single dose of um, pembrolizumab um, and then actually went on to erlotinib and developed um, a fatal pneumonitis. Um, so that was actually, again, the, the trial was run in the setting of uh, there was not a, a approval for frontline osimertinib at the time, so those patients did go on to erlotinib. And I do think that, as we've seen with other types of TKIs and, and other spaces, such as like the ALK space and ROS1, there is a lot of potential toxicity. And so I don't view that um, as uh, osimertinib-specific toxicity. I think that sequencing uh, an EGFR TKI and a immune checkpoint inhibitor has um, significant um, risk of having toxicity regardless of what TKI is. That's how I view it. You know, super helpful. And I do think actually that that study that you both published actually has really, you know, been an important contribution to our understanding about, you know, some, you know, some of all of these kind of circumstances we're talking about in stage three, but I think, you know, obviously in the, in the metastatic setting as well. So um, some other things that get discussed as well here are, um, you know, timing of Dervalumab for those patients who are good candidates for Dervalumab in that setting. Um, you know, obviously, uh, retrospective analysis kind of looking at earlier intervention with Dervalumab versus, you know, more distant. 
you know, this was you know, something that got a lot of attention early, seems, you know, to kind of not be as discussed so commonly. You know, how do you both view that in this concept? Can you clarify what you're, you're asking? Like the, the timing of, um, of Dravalumab post chemo RADS, you know, uh, oh, whether yeah. or not in earlier administration or sure. later. Is that so something that you, one, you think One about? thing that was a little bit interesting. So we, we had the Pacific study open. And for a long period of time, you actually needed to start treatment quite early like within a couple of weeks of the completion of chemo radiotherapy. Um, and that eventually was liberalized. Um, and as you're mentioning, there was data that indicated the patients who got their chemotherapy more quickly did better. Now, there are a few confounders. One, that's a group of patients that had been on study longer because for at the beginning of the study, you could only be on if you had uh, got treated in, in within two weeks. The other thing, which I think is probably real, is that if you're in shape to start your maintenance dervalimab very closely after uh, chemo radiotherapy, that's probably a different patient population. And those who need to delay it further are probably perhaps not in as good a position to derive benefit. So I think that there may be some issues that are real from that, but I think it's hard to know whether or not they have to do with the timing of the dervalimab itself versus the two issues being longer follow-up in those patients on the trial and the fact that it is a patient selection issue that these are patients who bounced back from chemo radiotherapy quite quickly and are presumably more robust. I think really good point. In, in your patients treated with Dervalumab, um, so firstly, you know, um, how many, like if you could estimate the percentage of patients that complete, you know, one year of Dervalumab, um, you know, what would you say actually? To that? For me, it would probably be a minority, but part of it is that that one year is a little made up. We, we, we have no idea what the optimal duration is. So as it becomes more difficult, oftentimes there's some reason to stop getting it. And I think it is hard for a patient to, you know, who hopes that they are cured from their therapy already to necessarily continue for, for a year. Um, at, at least that would be my experience. I don't know for the other medical oncologists what their experience has been. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's similar. I, I do think probably more than 50% my, 50 of my patients do complete it. Um, but certainly, um, as Eddie said, um, you know, with complications, especially as you're getting off beyond that six month time point, um, and again, that's where maybe PDL1 expression informs that if it's a PDL1 negative patient, they're having a lot of um, time of difficulty continuing beyond a, a certain time point, maybe more readily willing to stop. But you know, I think we just have to deal with real world situation. The trial was designed in a certain way, and that is what the benefit was seen. I agree that there's nothing, there's likely nothing magical about a year. Um, but at the same time, that's what was studied, and that's how we saw benefits. So I, I do encourage my patients to to complete the total duration if, if at all possible. That's my general I mean, it's super helpful. And I may actually just take also a poll, actually, Dr. Lashkari, Dr. Zhang, and Dr. Jurgis, actually, any, um, you know, your thoughts on, um, you know, are a good number of your patients reaching the year? Or, you know, what are some of the common reasons that may, you know, that, that may not reach that? Really, my comment uh, that you discussed the very sensitive subject, very important subject, because of neoadjuvant therapy in stage two, then when we come to unresectable, how can we make it resectable in order to get the benefit of using neoadjuvant? This is where the problem is and where we can extend the use of neoadjuvant to some percentage of unresectable cases. Yeah, I think that's 
you know, that's an important point. And I think that, um, you know, this is, I think, such a key component. And that's why I think even kind of this concept of resectability and really kind of, you know, seeing under what lens is that being evaluated? How subjective is it really? And actually what are really the standards that, you know, need to come in into this, I think are really critical. And I think, you know, kind of some of the components there are, you know, how important is the molecular tumor, I mean, the um, multidisciplinary tumor board in terms of, um, you know, coming to that and making that consensus. I think very good point. My understanding on the Pacific trial, I think my experience is very similar to what the trial reported. Approximately half of my patients is not able to finish the 12 months. And I actually have few patients actually progress right in the middle. But having said all that, you know, they just updated five year overall survival data, and uh, which is very impressive. I think that's probably why, at least in maybe UCLA or some other, uh, maybe UCSD, the, the multidisciplinary tumor board are shifting towards chemo RT followed by double or more. I, I think the overall survival is you cannot really ignore. The only thing I don't really quite understand is I, I'm not aware of, um, I mean, I believe the Pacific trial, the subset was greater than 25% or less than 25% pd one The hazard ratio is still very low regardless. Less than 25% of the hazard ratio is about 0.59, close to 0.6. That's still quite impressive. So I'm not really sure whether we should use that pd one uh, to choose a patient, especially you got a five-year overall, overall survival at 42, 43%. That's really hard for for me to ignore that. So I, at, at present time, based on the data, I'm not gonna use pd one to select my patients uh, based on the Pacific data. No, super helpful. And, and I really think your, your comments actually speaks to one of the last questions I'm gonna ask here in this forum is what is the best surrogate endpoint? And, um, you know, Dr. Loscar, I'll let you kind of just comment any, you know, any reflections you've had on Pacific in terms of- Yeah, thank you. Um, I. I have, um, I, I think it's, you know, it's a journey as, as everyone knows. And uh, at the beginning of the journey is oftentimes the toughest for the patients because they're being treated with a concurrent um, chemotherapy and radiation. And oftentimes that, um, that can be challenging, especially towards the end of treatment when the effects of, 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 of both treatments kind of settle in and Sometimes there can be some, you know, pulmonary and gastroesophageal toxicity, which can, uh, you know, plague the patient. I actually just saw a patient uh, earlier this week who just completed chemo radiation and is going to be starting um, Dervalumab shortly. However, um, after you know seeing her run through treatment very easily in the beginning. You know, towards the uh, you know, she's a couple of weeks after she's completed, she's, you know, requiring um, some supportive care, and so, you know, I I, I think that um, these patients by and large do do well, and I think this the you know I think the 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 immunotherapy the value map certainly has a, a great benefit, um, and I and I think we just have to be very very careful in in just guiding our patients through this, because the the effects of of, of pneumonitis, although perhaps maybe over, I don't know if it were, they were overstated, but certainly um, have been not as common in my practice as perhaps seen originally um, in the trial. And I think even in many patients um, who have gone through this anecdotally, um, we're seeing that patients are doing better and the risk of, of pneumonitis is not as severe, but still something that we have to monitor for. So I think it's just a matter of, you know, making sure that um, we just follow our patients closely, you know, immunotherapy for one year. It's, it's, it's very similar to, you know, putting patients on adjuvant, um, you know, uh, pembrolizumab or nivolumab for one year in the stage three and now stage two setting of melanoma. So, you know, we just have to be mindful of, of, of the effects of the drug on patients and certainly be mindful that these patients may not be as robust as some of the other patients going through treatment um, uh, because, you know, they're patients with lung cancer and, and have generally may have other comorbidities. Really good points. So, you know, just in the last few minutes that we have, you know, this now seems almost, um, you know, kind of a, a matter of assumption, but, you know, here was the Pacific design. 
uh, I think Kondra, Dr. Zhang had mentioned this, the five-year survival. So we're seeing that about a third of patients are alive at five years compared to about 19% um, in the control arm uh, with placebo. Um, uh, you know, here's the survival, I'm sorry, you know, that was the, the PFS, you know, 43% uh, versus 33%. And, um, you know, here's kind of the safety profile for that. Um, importantly, there was a, another analysis called the uh, Pacific R, which was an observational study of over a thousand patients also kind of um, showed um, an interim PFS of, uh, of 22.5 months. And so, um, you know, I think some key points here is, is that in the real world, the Pacific Regimen is still kind of, uh, you know, uh, playing out. Um, um, so I think, you know, some other kind of components just in the last is the most common reason for, uh, terminating participation in the trial, um, you know, uh, progression, you know, was the most common reason uh, on, um, on the trial. Here uh, shows some of the considerations around some of the subgroups with regard to the less than 1%, you know, kind of deriving less benefit with Dravalumab um, versus those that had greater than 1% post-hoc uh, PD-L1. Here's a list of the post, uh, the, the cancer therapies that were given post discontinuation. The most common was uh, chemotherapy. Um, and, um, and, you know, and the others are listed over here. In the um, placebo arm, about 30% of patients got um, immune therapy uh, post progression. And then here's a site of the new lesions that were detected with um, you know, the most common being uh, within the lung. So now you know, seeing this, the Pacific data is the one where we have the overall survival. A large part of our discussion was a discussion about neoadjuvant considerations versus Pacific. With Pacific, we have this overall survival, five-year overall survival. Does that influence the decision up front about guiding treatment decisions, knowing which trial has overall survival data versus not? I mean, how important and what do you all feel, and it'd be great to hear everyone's view on, on this, is what is the most important endpoint that we need to address here? Is it conversion of resectability or resectability, overall survival? event-free survival, past CR, you know, how do you guys process that? I think end of the day, overall survival trumps everything. <laughs> it's a golden endpoint in, in, in oncology. Uh, and I mean, this may be, uh, uh, I mean, maybe a nevo EP melanomas, you know, uh, you know, if you got a seven, eight year overall survival uh, with this respectable number, I, I think that the, the, the longer overall survival benefit you have, the less variation you should do in a trial, you should stick with the data. I, that's the way I look at it. So let you me know? ask you, Dr. Zhang, I mean, you, you asked a question about if you weren't able to completely stage the mediastinum, should you start with chemo IO? Or yes. you know, should you do the um, you know, kind of chemo rad you know, consolidation IO? I think that's where the trend is. I mean, the longer the OS, the OS data, I mean, I, I see that in tumor boards as well. That's why I like to kind of see what the other tumor board is the same thing is, uh, it does appear that they're sway more to chemo, RT, uh, and, and IO. Um, okay. Yeah, and I think, and I think the, the, long, the longer the data, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the more willing people is gonna try this more. That's the way I look at it. Okay, so just to resummarize, you know, kind of, um, I think what you were saying is, is that because of the longer overall survival data with Pacific, that yes. influences some of the decisions to preferentially consider that chemo radiation and consolidation over, say, doing something more avant-garde with chemo IO neoadjuvant. Is that yeah. what you think? Yeah. And also, you remember you, you were talking about with the, uh, 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 not too long ago, about, you know, like 
chemo RT and how long does it take for the patient to get to the IO part, right? The double part, whether that makes any difference. I think that will be answered by the Pacific two trial because now we're gonna move the double into concurrent chemo RT. So if there is a benefit there, then you know the earlier the better, maybe even do it together. So I think that question will soon be, be answered by the Pacific too. Okay, great. No, great points. Actually, Dr. Garen, your, your view on this last question? So yes. the one thing that I would just want to point out is that um, the one endpoint I'd be very cautious about is conversion to resectability. Um, remember, you can remove almost anything. What we don't know is whether it's helpful or not. So um, I agree the gold standard is clearly overall survival, but the one thing just to note that is going to be an issue is that there's different levels of follow-up between these studies. So you can have a five-year overall survival study from Pacific. You can't have that from Checkmate 816 for several additional years. And so I think that's one of the issues that in the interim is going to complicate our analysis, um, that we just don't have sort of apples versus apples comparisons between the endpoints. And do you feel that in the setting that we don't have that longer term data from 816, is it something where we should, you know, act, you know, how should we act in that? Should we just, um, you know, kind of say, well, we don't have the data, so we're going to preferentially do Pacific or, you know, kind of should we, you know, like what should we do in that circumstance? My personal opinion is that we're sort of back to where we were before all of this, which is to, sort of risk stratify the likelihood of a good outcome from surgery, and then make our decision based on that. Immunotherapy is likely to be part of the care regardless. Um, the benefit in most of them is really in the patients who are pd one positive and, and maybe even most, most of the patients who are, are higher levels of positivity. Um, I don't know that I'm able to make my decision just based on the fact that I wouldn't, I wouldn't absolutely definitively say that because I have five-year survival with Duralumab, that I'd push someone who I thought would do well with a surgical approach towards a chemo radiotherapy approach. I, I think I'm I'm back now at this point to sort of viewing those two as, as similar, you know, as, as similar approaches. Um, my previous reluctance for surgery and multi-station N2, um, I, I, I maintain my um, station seven, which is, is conferred a poor prognosis, also makes me nervous. And I'm sort of back to just integrating all of those inputs between the chemo radiotherapy um, uh, versus surgery decision. Very helpful. Um, Dr. Lisberg, your, your, your last kind of assessment of, of that question? Yeah, no, I agree with what's being said. I think that it was nice to have Dr. Boyes on the, the forum today to help us kind of talk about the difference between resectability and unresectability. And I agree that that's really the differentiator up front. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take a patient that was considered resectable and move them towards specific because of the overall survival data. Um, you know, the A16 data is strong and supports the use of that in patients that are potentially resectable. Um, and I think that that's a reasonable approach for the appropriate patient as well. Perfect. Um, well, you know, um, I'm Dr. Loscari, you know, kind of your thoughts and, and perhaps last words here. I, I'm, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, thankful that everyone was able to get on this call and, and discuss a, a very vital and interesting uh, issue. I do not have any parting words other than uh, thank you to our panel and other speakers and our attendees. And um, that we, uh, I wanted to just let everyone know that uh, this uh, meeting was recorded, so we'll have access to it on our MOASC website. Um, and thank you to our sponsors as well. Um, Dr. Hussain, any, any parting words there? We'll, we have uh, our next meeting uh, next month on, I believe it's the 26th of September, um, or 28th of September, rather, and it will be and we will be discussing, um, uh, uh, I believe, neoadjuvant therapy um, in the treatment of uh, lung cancer. So we look forward to everyone being there. Thank you. Thank you all. Really a pleasure. And thank you. Thank for, you. you know, thank you for everyone for contributing.
uh, their views here. It's really important, partly because the thing that, you know, it's, uh, um, it's a very nuanced and heterogeneous disease, you know, category here. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night, everyone.